Thank you to everyone for being here, for joining online, and for being here in person. This is our first uh, talk in person in more than two years. And so it is an adjustment. A lot of people were excited about this, but would rather still attend and watch online. Uh, and so things will take a little bit. A little, uh, little while to get back to normal. And so, but we do appreciate all of you who came up uh, to attend and all of you who are watching online. So, we in the new dynamics. And so, I am the curator here at the, and the curator here at the Law Museum, Dr. Michael Lujan, the And, uh, Well, but we have a whole bunch of technical issues this morning, but thankfully, hopefully, they are figured out uh, or this afternoon. And so, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the pizza talk, these are the Guam Museum's version of TED Talks educational sort of uh, talks. We bring in scholars who are doing important work, community members who are doing important work, people with big ideas, innovative ideas, people who are doing in-depth research either in universities or in the community that we want to amplify, we want to help get out there. And so um, our presenters today uh, really exemplify that, especially in the way in which they combine the resources of the academy, the resources of the university, but also the voices of the community. And so Dr. Kelly Marsh Taitana will be presenting today and will be joined by Malia Ramirez, uh, who, when Malia comes back, will do a blessing. And uh, I'm stalling for time until Malia comes back. And so the uh, the last in the Marianas is the name of the presentation today for the Sita Talk. And one of the things as somebody who used to be in academia, one of the things that we find is that scholars have done amazing work in terms of giving us an in-depth knowledge of the last from an archaeological perspective, from an anthropological, anthropological perspective, from a historical perspective, even from a cultural perspective. 
But for your average person in the community, they don't have time or resources to take a class at the university. They may not know about the books that have been published. Um, they may not make it to a teacher class at the long end. And so the project that Dr. Kelly uh, uh, helped spearhead, Latin the Marianas, is a, is a wonderful example of taking the research that has been done at the university level by scholars here in the Marianas, but also elsewhere, and then combine it with the voices of the community, combine it with the voices of elders, and combine it with students, combine it with those who have a very different perspective on what the Latin means, what it is, bringing poets, artists. And what, what, the res, what sort of the result of all of that is something which is informed by scholarly research but belongs to the community. And it's truly beautiful to see something like that. And so I'm very excited uh, to, to welcome Dr. Kelly Marsh Taikano for this uh, for this Ika talk. And I don't I don't think Malia is coming back, so I don't know if you if you want to just get started. I have a little bit of Okay. Okay. Just mark it. Uh, today, so good to have everybody here. Thank you for coming out. So, Dr. Babakwa did a very good job of giving an overview. And I'm going to provide a little bit of an introduction. This has been a multi year project, not just the book alone, but other aspects that have to do with our foray into understanding the Natimati Lati, the Lati Hori, Carby, and about the Lati itself. The next slide will come in just a minute. So with that, we started off as a Latin Cory class. And I'm very grateful. Uh, Joe Panata tried to be here today, but he wasn't able to make it. I am grateful to have Malia Ramirez here today. And I am grateful for their partnership. We've been working on these endeavors for many years together. They have always been an enthusiastic passionate and committed partner to the project related to Latin. And so with this, as uh, Dr. Babakwa pointed out very astutely, this project from the carving and the pouring class to the presentations and the exhibit, as well as the book that came out of all of this, this has been working with over 80 individuals in our community, and it is truly by the community for the community. My role has always been to be a facilitator. When we're working with something like Lati, it has to be by the Chamorro people, it has to be their voice, and even in the pouring and carving class, I can facilitate it, but it can only become a living tradition if the tomorrow students so choose to do so. So this is a double page spread that talks a little bit about efforts like ours. Uh, for Wahan and the University of Wahan, we worked with uh, Senor Joe Valoria. He had been experimenting with pouring and carving for a long time himself. And so he has been a co-teacher, a co-instructor for the class. And he has worked with the students in a variety of ways, um, helping them understand how to make tools out of volcanic rock. We have other experts come in that show us where to get these resources. And it becomes a course that is about capturing or recapturing the tradition. It is about weaving their own tool baskets. It's about identifying and finding their own tools, uh, the blades for them, and understanding where to look for them. Then it is about the students making and crafting their own tools. We then move on to it being the students that then identify and worry 
the limestone that we're going to work with. It doesn't have to be limestone. Laddie are made out of many materials, but we use limestone. And then it becomes an effort for them to uh, craft on that seed so that by the end of the semester, they should have a basket for their tools. They should have their own tools and they should have a DPP Latin when they're finished. And so we are fortunate. Um, I will talk about in a minute the students that are carrying this on because there are some students that have become the teachers and they are working at making this a living tradition. They are teaching the youth and the next generations here and in CNMI as well. But I do also want to mention, we were so fortunate, and this is what I appreciate perhaps most about the project is interacting with all of the cultural practitioners, all of the artists, all of the archeologists, all of the historic preservationists and the others that have made this book. They are each passionate and committed about what they're doing. And I have appreciated getting to know them and understanding them so much. So when we were in Sanita, we met Lao the Gomez, and we found out that after he retired, he dedicated a year of his life towards making two Lati a year. So at the end of the year, and you can see here, I'll turn on my pointer. You can see here in his lawn that he has uh, 24 Latin that he has carved himself. And not only this, he is interested in passing this on to others and working with the youth as well. See? This is Eva of Cruz. She is one of the students that has been part of this class since the beginning. And she has uh, not only learned how to carve for herself, but she's taught elementary school students, she's taught uh, students in youth programs, and she is now living in CNMI, and she's working to do outreach there with Lao and with the youth of there. These are uh, DPP Nazi that her students carved at, in Tokyo at MUHA. See? And this is Daniel Stone Jr. He also is someone who is carrying this forward. He also teaches some of our tomorrow youth in youth programs at Saving People in Tomorrow and other programs as well. And this is how it should be. I was there to facilitate, they are there to make it a living tradition. And so both uh, Eva and Daniel have also created chants that can be chanted while they're, um, while they're doing their work. So for Daniels, this is more of an instructional chant. How you perform the work, the pace, and why you do it in certain ways to be safe. Uh, for Eva's, hers is more inspirational and aspirational, and she wrote it along with her students. So these are some of the amazing things that they are doing to carry this forward. See? So I do just want to point out, and maybe I should have taken the air codes out, if you can go ahead and uh, see, go to the first one. So we have just four sections in the book. We have Kapopanos and Tati, Kapolati, people of the land and sea, people of the Lati. And so the book begins by hearing, as it should, helping everybody be grounded in understanding the tomorrow perspective. See? Then the next section is from the past or the future. And this is hearing from ancestors of the past by examining and looking at the Lati and the other um, ancestral artifacts that they have left behind. See? Nimalatla Lati, bringing life to Lati. 
In this section, we'll, we'll go over a little bit of it, but in this section, because it isn't a, a widespread living tradition today, we rely on our artists, our architects, and others to maintain and promote reacting so that it remains part of our consciousness and part of the tomorrow of Delhi. See? And the final section is Nanamka Mokna, our journey, journey forward. And so this is about what we must do to make sure that it isn't just something of the past that stays in the past, but it's something for all of our generations going forward. We want our grandchildren, great grandchildren, and all of the generations thereafter to be able to see and understand that. See? So, this uh, is the section that Joan always does a very good job here. And the main point of what he shares is that it takes all of us to safeguard that. Team. We all have a role to play and we all can be doing something. It's either by visiting a Lati site, taking others to visit Lati sites, um, or talking about that information that one has heard from their parents and grandparents as they were growing up. Joe does a much better job of this, uh, but the main point being that we all have a role to play. So here, this is uh, Maria's section, and Maria will also be doing a chant as well as um, providing a slide show. So we'll need this, but I do want to point out that this is Maria here. At the Senator Angel Santos Valley Memorial Park. And uh, to me, it's a very poignant photo of the connection between tomorrow's of today and uh, their ancestors of the past. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, just to first name, he's at the Wondersi Valley, that's an honored valley. So we look what the Eastern Mark, she was the one that pushed the flag forward, her and Joey Liston and all the others. And she said, uh, written by the community or and for the community, no breeds in it. But she is the one that was the guiding light to this project. So no, this is Marcy. And yeah, I'll just say Kelly, when Kelly told me, but we saw no problem now on to be here this afternoon. A five to do both senior, what you mean, I'm just like to address you about the spiritual or cultural connection that we see and no five to The Gale, what I wrote in the book, is that cultural connection. And Fred, you know, understand that. And you do not have to me when you're looking at me. All right, you're saying. By man and senior, we're going to ask how can I bridge the Latvi Baba County? So, being a traditional scholar, it's very different. Academic scholarship and traditional scholarship is very different. The Guawane, I'm a traditional scholar. I learned from the Chamorro elders. So what I did learn, all right, makes me understand how to see that, what is the lab? I'm not reading the academic books, no. I'm not referring to the academic books, no. I'm not saying that they are incorrect, but the only way I can connect to the lab is through the traditional connection that is handed down by generation to generation, quite to me. You know, you can even understand that. Whereas, when you're going to look at the Latin structure, you know, there are three things that you need to know. Yes, we need to see the power of the new Latin. We need to see
be interested and again while we are waiting for the uh the other project turned off SDGs, these are the three things that have been sent to that. Pinedina, Ilinata, Zan, Putwaman, Zan, Putilaki, Ilinitulu. Ilinitulu, in the beginning, Atakwara, there was nothing. But light and darkness. The Gentalo Iminata and Inemon, and in between the space of light and darkness, Guaha, Pugwa, and Lusaldo, there were two mortal gods. Sipauna and Sipunta, Pauna and Punta. Sa Imanzus, that Imanzus, the Manzusaldo, that they were not God, they were mortal God, Maklum, they knew, though Maklum is an Indian, that their life would come to an end. Zanino si Pauna, he magunisayan niya. When Pauna's life is coming to an end, you look at myself. Zan Kamasa, mapatinas ni Tasi, the ocean was born. Kinini Tihu, Ilagonia, from her tear. Zan Ayaki ni Tasi, Ilagonia. Puntan puntan cibut puntan puntan my brother. Zaki magud siya when my body comes to an end. Jokwa o kita kong tao don jokwa o kita si and cast it into the ocean. Ni mapatina si ni lago that is great for my fear. Minasi kis puntan and puntan the brother obeyed her sister Pauna. When Pauna's body, Pumana Nitasi, entered the ocean, Yaman Pumahulu, her body rose from the ocean. The Mapatinas and there was created. Itan, the land, Inapana and Juan, the land that was named Juan. Pauna, that and when Punta saw all of this and he had to risk it, Kumasa looked at him and began to weep. Samahalan, because he was very lonely. The Ginini Lagu Yatadonia, and from the tears of his eyes, Mapatina stole it with Anna. He got a manglo, he got a tassi, then he got a tamu, and the creatures of the earth. Sauruna, that Puruna. Pauna and Puruta, Ni Pumadina, Sitano, Ni Mapana, Wahon. Itanota, our land, Wahon, fourteen thousand feet above sea level. Nima Patina created to the bodies of the two human gods that put them in the moon. That's the first thing you have to understand. It's a good expensive. Pinena, Ininata, that life is sacred. Isigundu, Itano, Lokwi is sacred. I call that generation. When I was brought up, I had to respect the land. You just don't go and put those things where you want to, want to do. Here in Guam, the elders have always respected the land. That's the way I was brought up. They were very conscious about that. Sahapa, why? Because every step you make here in Guam, you're stepping on the bodies of the two human gods. Putin and Pauna. That's the second thing that you understand. Land is sacred. The land is sacred. Ilaki. So let's go into the Latin. You can put the slide now. I'll turn this off and put it back into the telling slide. Understand that slide. Any Pinedina, like Dinata, is sacred. 
with Morse always understood that. He need not doors, the lamp is also taken. He need not prayer, but is it that they consider sacred? Idima, which is from the word Uma, which means out. Those are the proto Austronesian words. They're not just words that came out of the to more people. Those are words that connected us to the first people that we are descendants of. Of a Sidima, the Haliti, the Latin structure, the Sidi that's also a proto Austronesian word. So, what does Haliti do? It supports. That's what it is. What does it, a final ascopoti, what does it support? Itasa, the cup. That could be a Spanish word. I'm not too sure. They say it's a Spanish word, but there are many words that are like Spanish, but they are basically proto Austronesian word, tasa. I'm not too sure. Of. But because the word tasa is a Spanish word when you say cup. Aliki, tasa. Idima. The house. So, in the history of the first people, Iman Mopona, the pre Ladi uh, Tomorrows, going into the Ladi period of the Tomorrows. All right. The Ladi period, Siyahuatsa, they were the ones that built the Ladi structure. Some friends don't understand that. The Vityanko went for the Latin structures bill. If we are assuming maybe, that the first people came here roughly 4,000 years ago, and we are now designating that the Latin period was somewhere between 14, am I correct in this? 14 BC, somewhere around here, or was it 800 BC? Uh, I think it's what, uh, don't quote that, I just forgot. But then it, it extended into what do you call that to the Spanish period when the Latins were still in Europe when the Spanish came in here. Okay, the Latin. So, how does the Latin today, for those who are poor, thank you for our others, build that spiritual connection or that connection made with her trying to say that is safe? In the same way that they consider the Nada sacred, in the same way that they consider the Dima sacred, I mean, uh, the Dalam sacred land, than the Dima. When I was growing here in Guam, it's the article that I wrote. Since I was very young, and when I enter a Guma, they don't talk me, put your statement for respect, because I take off of my footprint. That's tomorrow. All right, and I always wonder, oh, that's because it's a very simple exercise. You respect the house because you want you don't want to bring your soil footwork into the house. As simplistic as that may seem. In later years, so I was thinking about this. Really? Is that the reason? No. If you do tomorrow, you tomorrow. The footwear is called Dota. That's tomorrow. So I'm standing. And to the tomorrow, we get up. And my mom can say, when you walk outside of the house, wherever you go, it picks up. He now did the good, then he got what is not good. For example, you do not need the money when you're going to go into the house, the house of the man. All of you can put your shoe outside the house because you do not want to damage the house with your footwear because it has traveled for both good and bad. All right, it's set. So that's why, and you go with me in the same way as I see. When we go to our Roman Catholic church, it's not practicing on the day. But what do we do? We have the Alpha Ventita. 
than he does. The holy water. Remember that? So we put our fingers in the holy water. Why? To cleanse ourselves to all the holy water. In the more holy, the book that is not in the city. You can you understand that? That's where we do that. See, every single act of each of our students, there is a culture connection to the past. It's not that just to listen. We're just doing it today. That's the way we said If you look into it, there's a reason behind that. So going back to the last thing, in the way that I understand it, okay, because that time frame is so far from most of us present generation, you don't feel bad. All right? And we know that it's something bad. Right? But those are the, what do you call that, tangible objects that in the more distance eventually obtain that safety. In the more we say something wrong, that's a standard All right, let me give an example. And this is heavy, I couldn't find the small one, but I brought this. This is not a loser. This is a food, a small one. That's the Iman. And this is made to make medicine, almond. Understand that. Well, if I were to estimate the age of this Hutu, we can probably go back 1,000 years ago, get on your study or mosque or more. So what happened? I was invited to the Naval Regional Medical Center. It's a, uh, that's a Naval Hospital right up on the cliff line. Because the nurse, doctors, and all the health providers wanted to know what traditional medicine is. The Tamar connection. So I brought this. I brought the leads used for medicine. They understood that. But then I said, you know what's the difference between your practice and the traditional theaters? This remains. This becomes sacred. You modern doctors, you're using a stethoscope. When it's dysfunctional, it's disposed. When it's dysfunctional, it's disposed. Do the tomorrows know? Because as this goes down in the generation, the sacred hands from one generation to the other continues to give power to the medicine. All right? So in the same lightning, all right, we today, when we think of the tomorrows as a sacred object, the Latin, why is it sacred to the younger tomorrow? Well, because we need a connection to the past. When there was an argument about who's first here, tell them who built the line and what year. Because that was the argument sometimes that they put out. That the tomorrows are this, but it dates back to here. This, the object, the human remains, are testimonies of that first period of history. So, Milana, Itano, Ilati, Inachten, the burial grounds, they all become sacred in the perception of these of the generation of tomorrow that I talked to. Gates are a little bit different. They don't see those things because the transition of that knowledge is not being handed down. So you look at me. I've never been to a doctor in about 35 years. 
Seriously, go to any medical records. You're not going to see my name. What did I get that not? This traditional medicine. It's a, I'm not saying that modern medicine is not the way you go. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the validity also of traditional med medicine has its own merit. You see, you can't, you can't just dispose of it. The knowledge is there. Very simple medication. To assist your body, to your inanda, to your life, to the dogma where you get the medicine, because they produce, the plants produce the medicine from the ground, and the connection to the two human gods, Unfen and Ka'ul. They're that powerful because the land is their body, which we all derive for us to more going back in time. That saves us. The land, the Jimano, the many of the young, uh, the elderly, when we talk about Jima being sacred, and today it's a very different lifestyle, and my mother is special. My sister's friends come to the house, and they walk straight into the accent. Give that half an hour to me, and my mother will take. So I have to walk for me. Don't let your friends go into the bed. To do that, to rest, go out here, to be spirit. Do it in the town. Take it to support, power you. And to that, you get to get to support, power. Let your house go to them. And I say they don't respect the house. It's not a safe house. Be careful. He knows it's too hard. It's actually what you were brought up. And that's what we call Christianity. People do the Sahaba. See that? Then you began with your good there. Let me just have to thank you so much for not being there. Those are the more essential values of that. He liked me. I don't know if it discusses that. You know, when I talk, and I just talk with you that. One day, I was talking to you, one of the elders said, Oh, you're lucky. What is this? What is this? What is this? What is this? Well, if I'm running and I scrape my knees right and it begins to heal, the word you use is not the tool, not that you're sustenance. You're trying to shape it backwards so it's a form. Maybe that's what that means because it's not a natural, I would say, shape stone manual. I don't know, maybe that's it, but that word survives in time. The Latin means to shape, to form. All right, that means to get. So, what you form, what you form your house. And you have to let me be, the office, all the things work, all four of our things in our land. Even the office, the roof, poop, the thing that is on top of the roof that is measuring some, uh, some, some, uh, you see what you can learn with your tool and tomorrow, the connection to the past. This is the more right thing that this and our history was retained to many of our tomorrow world. That's all I can That level of uh, spiritualness of it, uh, sacredness of it. Tomorrow, when they go into a communicate thing in their own Catholic, uh, what we call the Church of Pisa, they respect the place. Maybe not so much today, people are talking about the church, but it's never been before. It's the first outside the country. So again, 
get to the very moment. I can tell you about that we are the only one with the line structure basically. We have them compared to the other cultures that have the shape. The shape, the symbols are different. The meanings are different. But the last piece of anything reminds us of the past. And how the ancient Moors built their house beautifully in the landscape. All these things that are going on in Guam, when I see them, they are sort of bang and all this. The light builders had a better concept of what do you call that? Island land use. Even with all these, I'm sorry, uh, knowledge we have about urbanization and all this, the Timors figured that out on the 2000 years ago. They knew how to use the land. They knew how to protect the land. Why? Because the land is safe. Like the house is safe. Uh, I guess if I'm not clear by now, I don't know what else to say. I have a lot to say. <laughs> but, you know, it's just I'm coming out as I talk through uh, that emotion. Okay, so uh, I look at this. This is the English Mary on it. How beautiful. And I didn't show all of that. With the exception of the Northern Highlands, uh, Ghani. And Ghani simply means place of uh, uh, half, half the band. Kagani is one of those. Ghani, Kagani, Yoga. You know, because it was not that many populations. That's why probably the folk that Northern Highlands, uh, Ghani or Kagani. And uh, a 1500, uh, I'm sorry, a 500 mile stretch, Guam, it was a Bobcat. Up to the north, this uh, mall was uh, around the Nintendo, and it's an art shape. It just looks like a home for the last stuff. And the icon, you know, when you look at the at the quarter that was given a privilege to all the states and territories, look at the Guam quarter. When you turn it around, the icon is a lion, a Goliath view, and we are one of these views because we have two official languages where the water has Chamorro that says Tommy in Chamorro. You can imagine how many of that circulating throughout the United States. You can say, oh, wow, they're not my Tommy in Chamorro. They're going to figure it out. Oh, look, the other language there. This is not me, it's Samoa did it, Hawaii did it. I'm not too sure about 40 guys I've seen here, they are 25 cents. But Guam, CNMI did not do it. But CNMI has the, the live structure in the Guam. So you have two places in the Mariana, CNMI and Guam, that put the Latin, and it's in the book that tells you this, at the icon, uh, a very important symbolic spiritual icon to the people of Guam. And even to the others that are that make one your home, they understand the theory too well because it's being uh, what do you call that? Uh, telling they're engaging people to understand the land to make uh, telling what is making people appreciate the land. This is what this book is all about and understanding its cultural and historical concept. Send out from Mrs. Lewis Moss. Such a good job of providing all of that foundation, if you will, of where we're going today with our talk. And if we look at this archipelago, it's important for numerous reasons, partly because the Lati, which, as Maria was saying, um, wasn't always here, and we are still figuring out exactly when it. it began to be carved and put into place. So the earliest that we figured it out for so far is perhaps maybe about 800 or 900 AD. Um, some academics will say about 1000 AD, but this means Imanal Kalmota, tomorrow ancestors were here for thousands of years prior to that. 
when we put this book together, it was important to make sure that we had tomorrow voices from all of the inhabited islands. So we do have contributors from Oaxaca, but also Salitan, Luta, Tinian, uh, to make sure that a breadth of voices are there. And this is partly important because if we're speaking about Latin, we have to talk about it throughout the archipelago. Throughout the archipelago, um, many, if not most of the islands, if not all of the islands, do have Latin there. We know many of those islands, but there may be some that we haven't gotten to, to really document or explore to see the Latin there. But we do know, and we will cover the book, covers all the way up to uh, Sudan. So we do know that there are Lati uh, throughout here all the way to Sudan, and we heard that there are sorry, we go all the way to Harvey. And we heard that there may be uh, Lati up north of Harvey, but we know for sure at least to Harvey. So the other part of that is that we did also get, now that there are more tomorrows living outside of the Mariana Islands, we did have some voices from there as well. Did Yes, yeah, so in that first section, um, just like Malia did, we wanted to ground everybody in tomorrow voices and tomorrow's perspective. And so we have our public practitioners, we have our Manumpo, and they talk about how to, how they were taught, how they live in these spaces, how their parents taught them to safeguard the last two and so much more. Mm -hmm. Then in the next section, it is listening to ancestors. And there are thousands of Latu to be able to explore. One of the main questions, and so we try to put together the main questions that people have. Why Latu? And It may not show up very well, but here we can see that if you weren't sure in archaeology, if you can find a post hole, you can find post holes, and we do. Um, I did some work recently for too long, and there are many post holes that are found there. And so we do know that prior to Lati, and maybe even sometimes during the Lati era, there were structures, houses, that were on wooden posts as well. So the stone came later, but the tradition of having Uma on posts was already here. See? The other question, that uh, Maria was bringing up is how unique are the Latin. We do know that there are wooden and stone posts throughout the region. With this, Latin are still unique. They are composed of two separate pieces, each intentionally and purposely crafted to each perform a specific function. Whereas when we look at these other stones that are in the region, uh, this is in pure box, it is a single stone column, and it is the roof of the structure that is right onto the column. And when we see here, this is Badu Lao in Palau. These are very tall, maybe about uh, six feet tall, 
uh, said to be for the very first buy or many needy talk there. So they also have a tradition uh, in the Philippines and throughout places like Sumatra and elsewhere. They have wooden house posts. Now, some of them have these discs here. And so one of the questions is, are the tasa meant to be like the disc, either functionally or symbolically? For the wooden disc, it was to keep rats out of the structure. But for the tasa, uh, it may have been more symbolic, and maybe the function was different. Um, Al Lazama from Al Lazama and others, uh, William Hernandez and so forth, they have experimented with this to see if it helps make the structure more earth shape. So, so we do know that we need, being so close to the Marianas Trench, especially, we do get some sizable earthquakes. See? So I got this photo off of Facebook. Our closest neighbor is Momo, which is down there, it's part of Ulysses. And this is a contemporary photo. It's a little bit dark perhaps to see here, but they do have stone columns, just like we call the Kiribati, that hold up the roofs here. And so our closest neighbors have this tradition in Ulysses, see? And I'll continue in this too. This is a photo from Dr. Rubenstein. He did his dissertation work and continues to be connected to Fites. In Fites, they also have this tradition of a singular pillar. See? I worked and lived in Palau for four years as a cultural anthropologist for their historic preservation office. So a lot of my time actually was spent like this, looking at the pillars of their body. They have, uh, we saw Gabriel with the six foot tall pillars. They're the only that I know of that were ever that large. But the tradition today is to have a boulder that they get from the river. And they say that they do that so that the soft rock is washed away and they are left with the hardest, most dense part of the stone. They place it there and they do, if you notice here, this is, uh, they often have a second rock. But again, it's not like a toss -up. It is not intentionally carved and, and engineered to be in place. I have asked and asked and asked their master craftsmen, and they keep on telling me that it basically is to make the boulders level because they are using bound boulders and they're not shaping them. I don't think like that team, we dig and put them into the ground to make them more secure, but I, I don't believe that they do that here. I believe that they just rest it here on the ground. Uh, they have boulders of close to the same size, and then they make up the difference by having that second small rock sometimes where it's needed. And this is a trust territory photo. So we can see columns as far away as Majuro uh, in the Marshall Islands. Actually, this is Arno, a toll in the Marshall Islands. So we can see that the more that we look, the more that we see those perhaps Austronesian connections, and we're still putting all those pieces of the puzzle together. What do they all mean when we have these similar traditions between the Mariana Islands and these other islands? Here we can see the range or some of the range actually, because we find some that are even outside of this range. Some as we carved in our class, which are BPP, they're only about 18 to 24 inches tall, but there really are some lacti that are only about 20 inches or 24 inches tall. And we can see here, this is Bumataga, the largest lacti that were ever built. 
these are similar to the ones over at the Kagatna the Senator Angel Santo Madden Memorial Park. But these are actually taller. Um, this gentleman is about 5'7", so about my height. Uh, but the Lazio over there are not embedded in the ground. So this here is here is actually larger than those. But we see some um, that are smaller and have more width than they do. Um, so, right, they're, they're less robust, right? They're slimmer when you turn to the side. And there are some that are made out of bedrock or tabular basalt that are very thin and narrow. Actually, one of the ones that the Senator Angel saw the flag part is this sort of a shape, where some describe it as two halibi together rather than a halibi and a traditional, what people think of as a stereotypical process. And some have lips or blues here at the top. And you can see that some are very thin indeed. See? So here I am at Caputo. And the one at Caputo here, it may be, we're not entirely sure, it may be one of the few survivors that has the capstone on the Halibi intact. If so, it would be the only one for Waham that I'm aware of. In Luta, they recently just found the second one at Alagun. There is one at Alagun, and they said, uh, a friend said that he found the second one over there. And then we know of the one at Sydney. So really throughout the archipelago, with the thousands of Lapti that were built, there are really just a handful where the Tassa is on the Halibi. And this is partly because with the way that it was engineered, the Puma was so important for keeping it all together. The weight of the house upon the Lapti is what help keep it all together. When we had uh, the division or weather or people abandoned uh, and left their Puma, then the Tassa eventually began to fall. See? Behind instead of on top, and it's covering exactly what you need to see, which is um, that behind that photo. This is uh, Lati. If you ever go to the onward golf course in Palacoco, uh, they have Lati there that are about knee high. See, and then our class that so we try to get to some of the different islands. We go to different Lati sites that are here on Wahan, and we also try to get to some of the Lati sites in the other islands as well. And here we are at Pumataga. It is said that this has been hit by that ship to shore type of bombing that was actually hit directly or with some shrapnel from one of those bombs. And yet that is how strong that Lati is, that it is still standing and it is still intact. Super typhoons, earthquakes, massive earthquakes, and even some bombing, World War II, and it is still intact. See? Oh. So, one of the things that we do in the book is we look at some particular sites. All Lati sites, all Song Song, like all village sites, all tomorrow ancestral sites are significant because of the connections that Maria was mentioning. They are sacred. And the ancestors are still connected to those sites. Given that, we did highlight certain sites because of their age, because of their accessibility, and things like that that make them particularly important for the community because they can go visit them, they can go connect to ancestors at them, and they can learn while they're in those spaces. See? Another important feature. So, as Malia 
Leo was mentioning, there are over a thousand archaeology reports that are written, and they will include Latin. There are uh, some very good academic resources, but we intentionally made this to be for the community. When you go through the book, you can read a section in three minutes to 15 minutes. A section is typically about 50 words long, 250 words long, and 500 at about the max. And we wanted that because we wanted it to be that people didn't see the chapter and feel like they couldn't get through it. We wanted them to be excited about the topic and then to look at it and realize they can read it in five minutes and know the absolute latest about that topic from an expert or a cultural practitioner who had been studying and practicing for 30 or 40 or 50 years. Here we have Alagun. So Alagun is the site in Muta where there are said to be two Latin where they're still intact. And we do have a photo of one of them in the book. But very importantly, in the archaeological reports, you will see plan overviews, these bird's eye views of the some of the villages. But most of us don't get to see that. We made sure to put some in here. And so here we can see this is the coastal area. It's a, a rocky cliffside basically here. And then we can see a more level plateau area where the people were living. And what we notice, and this is an Austronesian tradition that has been going on for thousands of years. And again, you can see it throughout the Pacific. You can see this pattern in Palau. You can see this pattern in Pointe because of those Austronesian connections and continuation. And that is at the base of the house, the length of the house here goes and faces and runs parallel to the water, be it a river, be it the shoreline, uh, or if those are not present, uh, perhaps a, a large geographical feature, like a cliff or a large rock or something else. So we see that by and large, they are following this pattern. They are pretty parallel to the shoreline. What we do also see, especially when we look at an upper side overview like this, I was counting them before I came here today. There are occasionally, and for a lot of ones, there are 53 I believe, sets that are that are documented here. But there are five that are perpendicular to the direction that every other Puma is going. So that is one of the pieces that we do not understand yet. Why? Why is it that every once in a while there is a Puma that is perpendicular? We see it in Tumon. We see it in um, the Valley of the Lati area in Kalapoto. We do see it in different areas. Sometimes it's near a body of water, sometimes it's not. What does it all mean? Oh, and I think this is in a lot of water. See? Okay. Here, so we have Uncle Al, the Tun Al Azama. He was one of the first, if not the first of the tomorrows to go with archaeologists. And he has perhaps seen more of the island, more of the ancestral sites, more of the ancestral villages than any single other person. Malia worked with him for many years. Would you say that's so? Yeah, that's correct. I was uh, Fred White. So, you know, the first to be the well, the National Service for the Fred White. Why I mean, I'm out there to very big now, yes, and so they did an island wide survey. They got to every site that they could so that they would have as complete a record as possible to start off the historic preservation office with. And when he was out there, 
He was inspired. He was connecting with his ancestors. And this may be, I'm still doing research on it, perhaps you guys uh, actually know this, but he may have been the first tomorrow to really formally re envision this ancestral life. And so he began uh, with pointillism and contact with the different types of art that he does. And he began to uh, either just show them as he found them, as we see here, but began also envisioning what those villages and what life looked like back at that time. And when I was younger, maybe you guys have heard this as well, but a lot of people were concerned or they didn't want to try to be envisioned. They were worried that they might be wrong in some aspect of it. The Spanish wrote so little, we're grateful for what's there, but they wrote so little. It's literally maybe about five sentences about the Duma. And, you know, it's, uh, it's just not very detailed. So people felt really uncomfortable about trying to be envisioned. But Uncle Al tackled that and helped us re envision these villages. It shows the importance of, as an artist, to go out to these sites and see them, to really understand them, and to depict them as they are. See? And next, it's up here in the museum. Um, actually, it's over that way on the second floor before you go into the introductory video that you watch before you go through the permanent exhibit. This is uh, David Luhan Sablon's artwork, and he is also the other artist. So Uncle Al did pointillism and cross hats, but uh, David Luhan Sablon, we owe him so much because he also was be one of the first that began this process of making vision. And we owe them so much. We owe both of them so much. Because before this, maybe you remember this, when we had posters, when we had calendars, when we had uh, books and we wanted to have something about Ima Natomona, we usually used those European illustrations from the 1700s and the 1800s. So they're positives and negatives. Um, they, they definitely have some drawbacks to them. But here you have tomorrow's re-envisioning and bringing to life in and out of Mokna and their life. And one of the things I really love about this particular painting, um, all of uh, Tim David's work is phenomenal. Uh, we all maybe grew up, I certainly grew up uh, seeing it in McDonald's and in the airport and places like that. And it really changed, I think, the public spaces so much. But part of what I really appreciate about this piece is that it envisions life along a river. So often with the artwork that we see, it's powerful and it's a wonderful, but it's often the coastal villages, which are important, but they're not the only type of land village. There were villages along rivers, there were villages that were inland maybe a mile from a river. And so the more that our artists continue to explore that, the more we all benefit from better understanding those kinds of See? Then I also got to meet uh, Richard Mankolonia from Luca, and I call it revisioning because he's taking those European illustrations that we all grew up with, and he's taking the archaeological and the other knowledge that we recaptured or we learned, and he places it into those European illustrations. So just some examples here of changes that he's made. Um, this Magalaki here is wearing a Sanaki, whereas in the original European illustration, they're not wearing any adornment. And he has placed Tokyo here, uh, the native breadfruit, whereas in the European illustration, there is nothing. And in the European illustration, there are straight autumns. 
more like that we saw for the Marshall Islands or Thais or uh, Momo. And what he did is he made them into black tea. So he choralized those European illustrations based on what we've learned over the years. And this is another one of his work where uh, they are at a Gumal Aki and see from their perspective by uh, Europeans making their way through tomorrow lives. And here we get to the final section of the book. Uh, we see, sorry, it's a little dark, but here's uh, Kun Alizama, here's William Hernandez, Maria is here, uh, uh, early Gillette Young Guerrero when she was going to the University of Guam and part of the Territorial Archaeology Lab, uh, and so many others. So this is the part that Joe often talked about, where we are not only preserving because the United States, um, the term is broadening, but compared to what the rest of the world uses, when we say preservation, preservation, it sounds and it often is a very stagnant sort of endeavor. Whereas worldwide, they talk more so, and in indigenous communities, it's more important in some ways to have it be about maintenance and promotion, transmission, those types of activities. And so we're very fortunate because in the Guam Preservation Trust, they do incorporate all of those activities. It's not just preserving a place and saving it as an exhibit to be looked at. It's to be lived with, it's to be promoted, it's to be transmitted, it's to be safeguarded. And just a, another look at that book where this is part of the promotion. Where sometimes I don't know how many times you maybe have gone through the doors at the governor's home, and maybe you have noticed the very, very tall, like seven feet, but then they're not uh, placed into the ground, so they'd be shorter uh, the way that human um, also won't know where to place them a couple feet into the ground. But they're very tall, seven feet, maybe even taller than that. And actually, that is their magnificent examples of metal lacquey. They are there. We see at uh, even the pedestal that the statue is upon at the Abbey is on a lacquey shape, the freedom of lacquey here. And then, if you go to see them on it, there are very similar types of memorabilia. This is at the judiciary uh, that they have there. Uh, it's one of the best plaques. If you ever get there, read that plaque. They give you really detailed information about that particular village and why that village is not there anymore. This is from the mayor's office in the Pandemica, and then some more out of it. But as you go through the book, that is one of the ways that we keep Latsi alive. We may not be carving it actively on a daily basis, but just about every logo, every, um, well, I can't say every tattoo, but a lot of tattoos and a lot of what we create for ourselves has the Latsi as a symbol on it. And so lastly, we look at that we look at Latsi in all kinds of varieties of ways in this last section. How people are making films about it, how people are making ebooks and interactive apps with it, um, and just so much more. It has become an icon, it's become a source of identity. And for many, it is also a call to action because of that source of identity and the strength that comes from it. So the last part that I want to mention is from beginning to end, this entire set of projects around Nazi, from learning how to quarry it, learning how to carve it, and going on this venture of creating a book where we gather together 
over 80 Chamorro artists and cultural practitioners and others throughout the archipelago and living abroad. One in Germany, which I didn't even realize that they were living in Germany when we contacted them. Um, so it's representative of the community in those many, many ways, but also in the partnerships with the Bond Preservation Trust, with Maria as the state historian who has guided us through so many aspects of, of many of these projects, including especially this one. And the others who have partnered and supported this, we have the Guam Visitors Bureau, the Humanities Council on Guam, the Humanities Council in the Northern Mariana Islands. And each of us that participated, we, uh, we also contributed a lot of our income to our uh, hundreds of things like that to do. But we wanted it to live beyond just being a single publication. There are so many books that have gone that path. They've been printed once and, and once only. So we donated it after we printed the ones that were donating to the libraries. We donated it to Guadalupe, and we will continue to work in partnership with them so that it will be available through Guadalupe, but for Guadalupe, all of the proceeds from those sales go to supporting the cultural heritage sort of work that Guadalupe does. And that seems like the right thing to do with a book that is written by the community and for the community about their own heritage. So with all of that, I say to you, Saanti, for all of your attention and for coming out for the very first of the heap of talks after a two year hiatus and uh, COVID to, uh, that, that kept us all uh, homebound for so long. After day, after day, see you We have any questions? We have about 10 minutes left. And so we have any questions from the audience? We have a few from online. Oh. And so when I saw Guam Houston for the Olympics, that's how I thought. That, uh, that's a, a little beyond <laughs> exactly what I know, but I believe what it is, and maybe Carlos can help me out, but I believe what it is is that, um, like with the volcanic formation, and this is true, I think, of the valley as well, um, that there can be breaks in it uh, in the arc, but the definition of archipelago is looser than that term. Okay. okay, I thought you were giving the the microphone so that we could answer. <laughs> Do you know uh any more about the archipelago if it's one or two? Well the the archipelago the way Sorry, the archipelago, the way I understand it, so from Sydney to Guam, I think geologically it's volcanic and limestone. When you pass Sydney, it's all basically volcanic uh, in terms of the geological formation. And it's like a two part. Okay, so from uh, an Athan to the tip of the Northern Marianas is one part, and then it ventures to the uh, east. Which is some even to Guam, and then the Marianas trench on the east of the Mariana Islands, Guam being closer to the Sea of Ocean. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know what you think now that you can find it in the current deeper than um, originally Guam. And that's the difference. Um, there, there are so many things that we have to go with the line structure too. All right, and I always uh, when I teach on history, all right. So when people settle a new place, what is the most important resource that they need to settle in that particular place? Water. 
water. So the word water, Nikamora, is common. That's the word was the ancient word that we carried all throughout in our history. And so you have the northern limestone to go with that type of water, and then the river from central to, to the southern Guam. When uh, Kelly was talking about this, I don't know exactly, but Guam was more settled, even though the Mariana. People were living in Seti Bay in Kamar to uh, People were living in Seta Bay, that's Sessa. People were living in Yatessa, all these places that were abandoned. Okay, they had a uh, free contact uh, up to the Spanish period uh, population there, a log in all the things. So I just want to mention this to, uh, to Kelly and all of you. So then what happened to the land? Why the destruction of its uh, baby? Well, that's where you have to focus so much other uh, historical uh, accounts in the past. So when the Spanish first came here, I see the estimation of the number of Comoros in the thousands. And then one record uh, stated after the missionaries came here, the population being out of that thousands of Comoros uh, living, some reports say 5,000 survived, some say 3,500 survived, one record states only 1,000. 500 survived in the entire Mariana Islands. So when you're looking at this in the Latin state, we lost the new culture. We lost the uh, the Latin culture of its native. Why? Because when you lose that amount of population, the techniques and technology, the knowledge dies with them. To move forward that particular character. Are you understanding the investment here? The people that made these supposedly Las Vela de Latinas, the most remarkable, uh, what do you call that ocean voyage that the Spanish described. But what happens when you have 1,500 people left? Where are those men that made this? And how they, they just stop? Same with the land, because they weren't able to build it. It's labor intensive. And technology to understand that when you're in the people. That's why they, uh, what do you call that, didn't perpetuate to the current generation, as you see in our neighboring islands. But the new culture uh, that, uh, uh, and Kelly, uh, uh, what do you call that, side of these islands, Moku, Yelithi, Lamu today, uh, all right, they have the new culture even till today. Because there was no disruption in the number of the population that can forge that tradition forward. The Timors didn't have that too many times to forge on the uh, traditional culture and knowledge. Luckily, the language saved them, and that's how I'm learning about it. But the language preserved what it happened in the past. Um, thank you, Dr. Kelly, for, for this initiative. For the presentation for the, the project is very, very exciting and, and the, the partners in the publication is also very exciting to see the, the connections that you made uh, so rightly on across the political boundary of one of the northern areas. It's, it's very good that it's a uh, spectacle of nice power of the northern area. Thank you very much for listening to the presentation. My question is for uh, for for you. You mentioned the alignment of the of the most of the Latin sites in, in parallel to the ocean, and you made a reference of occasionally uh, some some specific buildings being perpendicular. Could you have a little a little more is there, is there any particular area of one of the Marianas of the non Marianas where there will be more instances of uh, site being perpendicular to the ocean? Or how do you determine any kind of meaning to elaborate a little bit on more of that? Thank you. I'm so glad you asked that because I think that's exactly what that type of analysis is exactly what could help us understand this a little bit further. And I don't believe anybody's done it formally. Some of the archaeologists may have um, some understandings where about where it seems to happen more often. 
I have only looked at certain sites, and so I know for a fact it happens in Timon. I know for a fact it happens down there in Calicoco. I know for a fact it happens in the Labuan, but I don't know all the sites where that does happen. But I know that people are really interested. Were they canoe houses, but they're not always that close to the water? Were they women's menstruation huts? Well, we haven't really heard anything about that part of the culture. And so, uh, yeah, the speculation is still out there. But I think that that would be an excellent first step towards creating that kind of analysis and just looking at how often, where, and was it something that happened later or earlier uh, would also give us some clues. Um, I don't know that maybe you can verify this more. But from my understanding, it's hard from the elevator. And when the tumor is buried here again, the feet must face the ocean, not the head. In the positioning of, so you have to understand all these problems. In tomorrow, we say, in the Nekuriyato, the rising of the sun, in Minatuniyato, the setting of the sun. Those are cultural concepts that we also uh, really call them. In practice, we call it the, the, the nature of putting the feet facing towards the right of the sun, when buried, and the head facing. The uh, what do you call that? The study of the sun. But in today's uh, what do you call that? Uh, cemetery, the modern cemetery, there's a total disregard of that. They don't have to be, and they should follow the tradition. The feet, no matter what cemetery, must face the rising of the sun and the head, the setting of the sun. But again, when it is not culturally known, and practice is what happens. So uh, the Latin structures, from my understanding, if it's coastal and it follows, and, and there is a reason behind that. Or you can know the Yakto, or you the Yakto, and you mention the Yakto, but also it also follows the landscape of the land if it's what you call that and something come up. Okay, if it's uh, a cliff line and it's going this way. Then the houses are situated. I think the text that kind of uh, explains that uh, when I go there, if you see the position of, of the lap, they're more because it's a little bit set inland. Uh, but then, you know, the, the mics affect the water level has changed uh, from, from the time that, uh, that that the water was more inland. But, you know, the what you call that, the right to the ocean then, as, as it is today. Does that make sense? So you have to understand the cultural concept, the practice, to understand why these things are positioned the, the, the way they are. And so, uh, for those of you that are not familiar in Southern Bosnia, so how do, how were they distinguishing the three ladders of the ladder? All right, according to the archaeologists, is that the three ladder burial. Do not have the Latin structure. And I made that an incorrect date. It's uh, what do you call that? 800 to 1500 AD. So that's the Latin period. All right. So uh, what do you call that? Uh, the practice of burying the dead next to the Latin structure, that's a given fact. But from my understanding, when you go into the naval land area and it's rich with value structures, the value and barriers are not, my question is, as you can see with the name before, that you don't find the barriers as close to as many are as opposed to the area. And that, I have to check on this because I don't quote it, but I'm just saying that, that uh, when you find a value set, you're going to find barriers. You can say that. Associated to. Okay. I was just going to say, even in uh, Magma, where they thought that there were no right, barriers, yeah. we are finding yeah. that upon the plateau, on the bridge, there are barriers. Well, you know, I, I really wish you guys would have seen that because I went to do the ceremony at Magma, the youth uh, marine base. And, you know, I grew up in Guam, but I've never seen them 
that the Timors would bury her dead in that manner. I mean, to me, that was just a clearness in my mind. Because you always thought that, that you know, fairies don't exist in that interior, what do you call that dense limestone board. But then if I go back to oral history, and the elders would go like this, and you can sit there and stand about to me and get more.